Hi, everybody. How are you doing? I just want to get a feel for who's in the room here just before I start really quickly. Can you put your hands up if you're a dev? I have a technical background. You code. Brilliant. How about testers? Do we have any testers? Yay, look at the testers. Um, do we have anybody who's in an analysis or subject matter expert? A few of you product managers, product owners, a couple of people. How about scrum masters, agile coaches, people responsible for change? Okay, so there's a bunch of you as well. Thank you very much. But it looks like overwhelmingly there's, there's devs here. Um, just to give you an idea, this is not going to be a technical talk. I will be mentioning Cucumber. That's about as technical as it's going to get. Um, we're not going to code. <laughs> Uh, but I will be teaching you how to get the conversations playing into that. So if you wanted to go to a code talk, I suggest you wander out and have a look and see if anybody out there is, is programming and go join them. Um, just to give you a bit of background, my name is Liz. Uh, I have been doing BDD since 2004. So I was one of the original devs on the JBehave project, which was the first ever BDD tool. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how it started and where it came from um, and what it is. So is there anybody here who's not really come across BDD before, knows nothing about it? A couple of people. Fantastic. OK, you're going to have the best time because you've come with the empty cups and no biases. Very good. All right. Um, if you go to the Wikipedia page, uh, Dan North, who created BDD, who's the person who created JBehave, he actually has this lovely definition of BDD. And I'm going to read it to you because it's too long for me to remember. But you can find it on the Wikipedia page. He says, BDD is a second generation, outside in, pool-based, multiple stakeholder, multiple scale, high automation, agile methodology. It describes a cycle of interactions with well-defined outputs resulting in the delivery of working, tested software that matters. Um, I find that a little bit of a mouthful. It's all completely accurate, and he has a great talk where he breaks all of this down and explains what it all means. Um, that tagline, software that matters, has always been a part of BDD, and that's what I want to create today. I want to help you get to the point where you're delivering software that really matters and not wasting your time on the stuff that doesn't. I have a much simpler definition of BDD that I use. Um, I reckon it's, it's using examples to illustrate behavior of a system. I actually use it for people. I use it for all kinds of systems, not just technical ones, um, and how that system behaves. Really, really simple. So let me show you an example of an example. Um, given Fred bought a microwave, and the microwave costs 100 pounds. When we refund the microwave, then the micro Fred should be refunded 100 pounds, right? Really, really simple example. We all know how this works. We've all gone to a shop and got refunds before. And you can imagine if you have some till software, you could actually play this scenario through the till software and check to make sure that refunds are working. Great. Really easy. OK. This is a template we use in BDD. It's called given when then. So given a context, when an event happens, then an outcome should occur. And you can have any number of givens, the context in which this thing takes place. And you can have any number of outcomes, things that you need to consider. Normally, there's only one when. The exception being when we've got uh, people interacting uh, or time passing, something like that, and you need to consider both to explore how that behavior occurs and what it looks like. I normally suggest if you've got more than about seven steps, you're probably trying to do too much at once, see if you can split it up a bit. I've only got 45 minutes today, so I can't do my full tutorial on how to split up a scenario, but hopefully when I talk today, you'll get some ideas around it. OK. People don't talk like this, by the way. Um, if you actually talk with people, they will never use the words given, when, then, when you ask them, can you give me an example? Um, they'll, put the, they'll do things like, yeah, so I should get this because I did this thing earlier. So I'll put the context after the outcome. I don't mind. I just write down what they tell me and then work out how to do given, when, then on it later. Um, it's OK just to listen to people. I think it's a very underrated skill. Hands up, devs. We're the worst at it. <laughs> OK. You can see here, I've got this little word should. right? And the reason that we have this word should, I actually went through a phase of not using the word should when I was going through these scenarios. And I've started putting it back in, not just because it's easier to tell the difference between givens and thens, 
um, which can sometimes get confusing if you don't have it, but also because it allows us to ask this little question, should it? When I actually started doing BDD, um, we had Jay behave. I said it was the first BDD tool. It was largely unusable. Hardly anybody was actually able to use it. Jay behave one, nobody ever used. It used to have classes which were in camel case, and when you ran through the scenarios, it would output the English. And it took forever to set the, these classes up. Um, it was very, very slow. But as a result, people always had these conversations. I think it's still think it was absolutely the best BDD tool of all because of that, because it really helped people to have the conversations. And I kind of miss those days where people focused on it. Uh, hands up if you've come across Cucumber or one of Specflow, but Jay Behave, one of those. Keep your hands up if you're actually using it. Keep your hands up if you also have conversations before you use it. <laughs> and a few hands go down. This is what a lot of people think of BDD is nowadays. They think it's the tools. They think it's having those conversations so that you can do something really cool with the tools. Um, I will tell you by the end of this talk, you will understand that having the conversations is the most important thing. It's more important than capturing those conversations, writing them down, and that's more important than automating the conversations. And by the end, you will understand why. Okay. So I said this little word, should allows you to do this questioning. It allows you to ask this question, should it? Should it really do it right now? Should it really do it for this release? Should it do it in all these contexts? Should it do it for all these different stakeholders? Is there anything else it should do? There's a couple of questions I asked that I find really great for eliciting that information. So I'm going to share those questions with you. Um, before I do that, I just want to share a little story. Um, back in the days uh, when I first started, so 1990s, I'm older than I look, um, we were on, I was on this defence project. And you can imagine defence projects, they like to get things right. So they do an awful lot of analysis. Um, and we were, I think, I, I joined the project, there'd been a year's worth of high-level analysis, and then half a year's worth of high-level design, and then they'd been coding for six months, and then I joined. And I was in that basement working on that defense project for three years. And they did like let me out at night and stuff. I was literally in the basement for three years. But I, there was no daylight. There was no windows, no natural light at all. Um, it was a bit, bit sad. After I left that project, it went for another year. And it finally made it to court. Um, people were suing each other because change had become so hard to do. And it just didn't quite deliver. In fact, the next project I worked on was also kind of waterfall. And the one I worked on after that was also kind of waterfall. And then I went and joined ThoughtWorks. And at ThoughtWorks, I wrote something in the first week that made it into the stores a month later. And I went, oh, this is amazing. Everybody should do this. I went through one of those agile evangelist phases where, you know, you're all doing it wrong. Um, hands up those coaches who've been there. I'm not going to ask you to keep your hands up if you're still there. <laughs> okay, so we're now at this, this place where we understand you can't get it right with that much analysis, and we're doing so much less. So we have to assume we're getting it wrong, okay? We have to assume we're getting it wrong. And the thing I love about these conversations is it's a really lightweight way of finding out, just as a first pass, what you might have got wrong. Okay, so this is the first question I ask. I ask, given the context, when an event happens, then an outcome occurs, should occur. Is there a context in which this event will create a different outcome? So is there any context in which Fred brings his microwave back and he doesn't get 100 pounds? Shout it out. It's damaged, right? It's damaged, he damaged the microwave. Anything else? Doesn't have a receipt. It's out of warranty, it's too, the receipt's too old. Brilliant, okay. Um, is there any situation where he would only get 90 pounds back? Maybe he's exchanging it. Yeah, he might be exchanging it for something. Um, it's on a discount. It costs 100 pounds, but it was on 10% 10 10 discount, right? So you can actually just start looking for these contexts, and now you've got all the scenarios you can think of. And we've come up with some scenarios really flipping fast. 
just having these conversations. That's how fast it is. OK, so we can see there's lots of different ways of getting the context out. The second thing I ask is a bit more tricky. Is this the only outcome that matters? And I, I like asking the question, if we did it with pixies, would it be enough? Now, there's a reason I do this with pixies. Um, and it's because I'm a dev, and I know what we're like as devs. Okay? If you give us half a problem, we're already coding the whole solution in our heads, and we stop listening now. Um, and we're, we're brilliant at solving these problems, at jumping to these abstractions. We've got that intuition thing going for us. We've got that gut feeling going for us. It's the one thing that allows us to progress in uncertainty. Um, the problem is that if we're coding, we're not listening to the problems. So what I always say is, imagine it's a pixie. Um, has anybody ever read Discworld novels? Um, if you've ever read Two Flower, the tourist, he's got this little camera. And when he takes a photo with it, there's a little imp inside the camera that paints the picture, right? And he sticks it out the front. And Two Flower takes a picture and goes, well, that's a funny color. And the imp says, yeah, sorry, I read out of blue, right? It's like that. There's a, there's a pixie in the cash machine. So if I go to the cash machine and I say, give me 20 pounds, and the cash machine gives me 20 pounds, so the context is all set up to give me 20 pounds, what else does the pixie need to do? I got my 20 pounds. All good, we're done, right? What else does a pixie need to do? Debit my account. Absolutely. Okay, it's got to debit my account. Um, otherwise, you know, it's free money, which is great for me, not so much for the banks. I'm pretty sure it'll sting us in tax bills later. Okay, so it also has to debit the account. Who's into agile user stories? As a user, I want the bank to debit my account. So, wait, no, I don't. It's not for me. <laughs> there are other stakeholders involved in these projects. And sometimes by thinking about the other stakeholders, thinking about the other outcomes involved, you find things that you also need to include, okay? particularly when there's other stakeholders. And I like looking for transactions. Um, I was talking to somebody about a halo ride, because I'm in London and we don't like their competitor. Um, so Halo, taxi company, black cabs, rock up, pick you up, and there's a little app. Uh, what happens when you've finished your journey? You get a little confirmation that says, great, you finished your journey. But something else has to happen too. Money goes to the taxi driver and money goes to Halo. There's often three people involved in transactions, three, three stakeholders. OK, so let's imagine that um, Fred brings back his microwave, and he it's fine. There's nothing wrong with the microwave. It was just the wrong color. He picked up one that was the wrong color. Um, you don't have the right color in stock, so he wants a refund. But we've now got a working microwave. What might we do with that with respect to the software? What else might we do? Right, we might put it back in stock. Right, and Our stock count is going to increment by one. OK. Now, can I deliver? Imagine I'm, I've got this white goods thing. Um, I've got a shop. I'm not brilliantly tech. Um, I'm still doing everything on a calculator. I'm still using carbon paper for receipts. I've got one of those clunky checkbook things that you used to have. Do you remember? Um, and every Saturday, there's a line out the door. Customers want to come to my store because they know I've got good stuff. They know I'll treat them right. But there's a line. And some of them end up going to my competitor. And that makes me sad because my competitor doesn't care about customers the way I care about my customers. Would it be useful for me to have some till software that just dealt with scanning things, ringing up prices really quickly, but didn't manage to do the stock control? Yeah, you could deliver me that. It'd be useful, right? This is how we get an MVP. What would be the smallest useful thing that we could either deliver that would be valuable or that we could learn from? OK, so you can definitely deliver that to me. And then we could do stock control later. Or maybe if stock control is the thing that's really hurting me, we do the stock control first and the, and the till stuff later. Those things can be delivered independently. How about the cash machine giving me money without taking it out of my bank account? <laughs> right? If we deliver those two things separately, we're going to have a problem. 
So for those of you who are automating this stuff, whenever you get something transactional like that, where the things have to be delivered together, I like to see them in at least one of the scenarios together, just to make sure they don't get separated so that people can see those things are related and they both need to happen. OK? All right. So there we go. Given Fred bought the microwave, microwave costs 100 pounds. When we refund the microwave, then the microwave should be added to the stock count. With those three questions, can you give me an example? Is there any other context that creates a different outcome? Is there any other outcome that's important? I can pretty much elicit any requirements. You just got my whole B2D tutorial in 20 minutes. OK. There's a little bit of a, a, a confusion that I find people have around acceptance criteria versus scenarios. So this is a scenario. It's concrete. It's got a specific customer. I like to actually give my customers names. Um, you can use first person if you want to. You can say, give an eyeball to microwave. I find if there's multiple stakeholders having third person, you know, give them a name. Use a persona name if you've got personas. It makes more sense. A lot of people like using really funny personas. They'll have clunky Clarence who can never put his card number in correctly and, and kind of things like that. Um, it's a specific item, and it's got a specific price, and there's a specific discount associated with it. That is not the same as this. Given an item was sold with discount when a customer gets a refund, then he should only be refunded the discounted price. And this is a really, really common thing that I see with people who are new to BDD, picking it up for the first time. They'll phrase given when then in these kind of terms. This is not a scenario. If you give this to me, I'm going to ask, can you give me an example repeatedly? Can you give me an example of an item you might sell? Can you give me an example of a typical price for that item? Can you give me an example of the kind of person who's your customer? OK. What does it look like when it's a discounted price? So we're using specific elements. That's what makes this a scenario. And you can see that when Fred walks in and gets with his microwave, you can actually imagine Fred. Um, in my head, he always looks a bit like Dan North with a flat cap, OK? carrying in his microwave. Um, you don't have to phrase the acceptance criteria in scenario form at all. Frequently, I just put it at the top. This is the blurb. Items should be refunded at the price for which they were sold. And now we've got an explanation of the behavior that that scenario is illustrating. It's just there for illustration. It's not defining the behavior. It's just giving you some examples of it. That's all it's doing. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about why this is important. As I said, I started off in the waterfall world. And when I did waterfall, we used to have the devs would do their code, and then they would give it to the testers. You know, I'd write my programs, I would give it to the testers, and the testers would go, oh, that's awesome, and it would go into production. What? No, testers don't do that. <laughs> testers are evil, evil people. Hands up, testers. I love you, but you're evil. Um, I always say testers break my code, and one tester said, actually, your code was always broken. <laughs> Thank you for that. Make me feel good, you know. Um, Dan describes it like uh, coming back from kindergarten with your glitter and pasta picture, you know, and you give it to your parents, and your parents proudly push it up on the fridge, except you give it to a tester, and they shred it into tiny pieces and go, there you go, and give it back to you. You're like, oh. Um, testers have what we call deliberate dis discovery skills. They have the skill to deliberately discover what is wrong with my code. And it results in rework, bugs. OK? So what we do instead with BDD, we get the testers involved first. The testers are perfectly capable of telling us how they're going to discover what's wrong with our code. And if we're cunning and we ask them to apply those deliberate discovery skills early, and we go, can you think of any scenarios we've missed? Can you think of anything we haven't considered? And the testers go, yeah, you're going to miss this, 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 and this. We go, ah, watch me, I'm not, not now. Right? And then we stand a much better chance of getting it right. There will still be stuff we miss. And when I introduce Kinev into you, uh, you'll understand why. There's less rework, not no re rework. OK, so that gives us the three amigos. We have somebody who has a problem, usually a product owner, an SME, somebody who has the expertise and understands what it is they're looking for. 
We have somebody who's going to solve the problem, the dev. Sometimes a dev pair. Maybe you've got a UI designer in there as well. Matt Wynn says it's three amigos, where three is a number between three and seven. More than that, you've got too many. And then we've got the evil people who see all the other problems that you missed, the critical thinking testers. Okay. I actually spoke to a tester when I was, I was doing my tutorial, and the tester said, but what you're asking us to do is analysis. I said, yes. Your role is now to help with the analysis. It doesn't make you an analyst. You're still a tester. It's still your critical, deliberate discovery skills that we need. Even the analyst is going to miss stuff. If you can't get hold of a tester, you might well use an analyst as a tester. For goodness sakes, don't use a dev. We're problem solvers, not problem finders. I can shift that mindset, but only because I've been doing this for so long, and it, I'm not brilliant at it. I might be good at it. It takes me a full day to shift my head. I definitely can't test my own code. So um, see if you can find a tester. I, I'm very sad at the movement I'm seeing these days of getting rid of testers and putting you know, dev developer in test. I'm like, that does not make any sense to me. Um, so testers, I really, really value you. I speak a lot at testing conferences because apparently this is a message you all want to hear. You're needed. Um, and if you can devs get that message out to your companies as well, don't get rid of your testers. Just teach them to code. Okay. People ask me who should write the scenarios down. Um, I used to say it doesn't matter as long as you have the conversations. What I found was that if you make it the devs, uh, if you make it the analysts or the testers or the product owners, the SMEs who write the scenarios down, that conversation never happens. These days, I say get the devs to write it down. Devs can type really, really quickly. It doesn't take that long. Okay, you get the devs to write it down, and it gives you a feedback loop. You can then look at it and check the devs' understanding. And often there's a scenario you, you missed as a tester or you missed as an analyst as well. You know? And by analyst, I mean somebody who can analyze that aspect of the business. It's a role, not a title. Okay? So I say get the devs to write it down. Have the conversation, and then get the devs to write it down. If you do need to write something down ahead of time, try and just have a bit of a chat and just write it down without the given when then, or even just name the scenarios that you need to consider, that you need to talk through. That's usually enough to estimate in story points, by the way, just naming them. Um, but I also hate story points, so I'm not going to talk about that. It'll get me in trouble. OK, so having the conversations is the most important thing. That's more important than writing them down, and that's more important than automating them. Brilliant. OK, so that's, that's great. We now know how to code. Right, we know how to do BDD. There's this lovely book, Tom DeMarco and Timothy Lister. A very short little book, lots of lovely stories about IT. It's quite old now, but the stories are still really relevant and lots of fun to read. And it starts on chapter one with that quote in a box. If a project has no risks, don't do it. For a project to have no risks, it would have to be something that you have done before in exactly the same way with the same people. And why would you do that? We're always trying to provide something new for our businesses, something they don't already have. And whenever we do that, it's risky. I talk about risk with respect to uncertainty as well as the risk logs, the certain things we know might go wrong. Okay, so I'm talking about uncertainty here. So I want to introduce Kenev into you, and just to give you a flavor, I'm going to start by introducing something a little bit more familiar. Do you remember the very first mobile phone ca with cameras on? Who remembers really early day mobile phones? If you go to Wikipedia and you have a look, you'll find um, Kyocera and Sharp were actually the ones who made the first ones. And, th and they, they made them landscape mode with the camera pointing towards the user because they thought people would want to make video calls with them. Right? Um, and it's really interesting. It was a differentiator for them, something different that they were doing that nobody else had done before. And of course, they made discoveries when they actually put this thing in the market. They discovered that the internet didn't quite support that bandwidth right then. Video calls couldn't be a thing. Um, they discovered that people were going to use it to take photos and kind of turning it around and trying to take photos with the camera on the wrong side. And Nokia saw this. Nokia spoiled the differentiator. I see what you're doing. I can do it too. And then it won't be different for anybody anymore. OK, that's spoiling a differentiator. So they put the camera on the back. Does anybody remember what else? There were two things on the back next to the camera. Anybody remember what they are? S 
the flash, the flash was one, and something else related to the camera. It was right next to it, round, silver. It's a little mirror so you could take selfies. Right, Nokia invented the selfie. Thank you for that, Nokia. Okay, um, so little mirror so you could take the selfies. That was how they did it. Hands up if you've got a camera on your phone. Keep your hands up if you've got two, one on the front and one on the back, right? They have become commoditized. They are now a really well understood problem. They're very stable. We know how cameras work. We know how people want to use them. We've done the exploration. And now that we understand it, we can now build on it and you get things like um, the immersive reality apps, Pokemon Go, stuff like that. In a few years, you'll probably see libraries come out that make it so easy to do immersive reality. Everybody's walking down the street like this. Right. Who knows? It'll be new. This is a cycle we see over and over again with different types of technology. Now I've shown you one example. You can probably think of others. Any kind of tech that started off differentiating and then became stable. And you end up kind of taking it for granted. The internet, USB hard drives which you don't even have to park. I remember the first drive, I didn't have to park, it was amazing, okay? We see this cycle all the time. The reason I introduced this first is because the dynamics in the Kinevin framework are as important as the domains. Kinevin is a framework for making sense of different, of different situations, depending on how uncertain or certain they are, and it gives you some guidance as to how to approach them, heuristics being one of them, okay? Um, it's really, really easy. The hardest thing about it is pronouncing it because it's a Welsh word. So can you all say the name Kevin to me, like Kevin Costner? Say Kevin. Put an un in it, say Kenevin. You've got it, brilliant. Okay, so now I won't get in trouble with Dave Snowden for that. It was created by Dave Snowden. He introduced it in a Harvard Business Review article called The Leader's Framework for Decision Making. It's available for free. If you search for it, you'll find it. It has five domains. They are domains, not quadrants. As we've seen, the borders are fuzzy and things do move around. So the first domain we look at is the obvious domain. An obvious problem is one which either a child can solve or if it does require expertise, the solution is obvious. So I go to my landlady in the pub and I say, well, what do you do when the beer runs out? And she says, well, I change the barrel. Obviously, duh. Right? I think of these as duh problems. And you can categorize the problem. You can go, oh, okay, it's one of those. I recognize it. So it's things you recognize. They don't really require much expertise, to at least to know what the solution should be. As things become more and more complicated, they require more expertise. So a watchmaker knows how to fix your watch. A car mechanic knows how to fix your car. The end result is still known. It's a known outcome. And because you have the expertise, you can close the gap. You can go, oh, OK, I can see where we're trying to get to. I know where we are. I can see what we have to do. That's called analysis. And analysis works really well in that complicated domain. Um, a lot of things which are mechanical end up there, things which are made up of parts. The problem lies down here in the chaotic domain. University College London did a little bit of an experiment. They uh, took some people um, and got them to play a game involving snakes and rocks. And if you turned over a rock and it had a snake under it, you got an electric shock. If it didn't, you were fine. And the idea was you had to learn to predict the snake population and where they were hiding. They also measured people's stress levels while they were doing this test. I don't know who volunteers for these things. Um, but they measured people's stress levels. They found the people with the highest levels of stress were the ones where there was a 50% chance of a snake being under a rock. Not the ones who were more certain to get shocked, they kind of got inured to it, I guess. Uh, not the ones who weren't getting shot as much, they were quite happy, but the ones where they didn't know whether there was going to be a snake or not. They were also the people who were best at solving the problem. They had the most incentive to solve the problem quickly, right? We would rather have certain bad outcomes a lot of the time than hang on to uncertainty. And so we try and make things certain a lot of the time in places where we really don't want to. And it's because of this. It's because we don't want chaos. Chaos is accident and emergency. Chaos is your house burning down. 
Chaos is a transient domain. It resolves itself really quickly, and it might not resolve itself in your favor. End of 2012, there was a company called Knight Capital Group released something to eight of their nine servers. When they went to market on the Monday morning, that ninth server started making spurious trades that made no sense, because they forgot that ninth server. It took them 45 minutes to switch it off, by which time they had lost so much money that that large trading group no longer exists. I think it was something like $440 million. You can read that story on Wikipedia as well. That's chaos. Urgent production bugs that are going to destroy your business. In chaos, we have to act and act really quickly. And that means we have trouble dealing with places where actually it would be safe to try something out. We're not in that much urgency, but the outcome is still unpredictable. In the complex domain, cause and effect are correlated in hindsight. You can see how you got there, but you couldn't possibly have predicted it. Hands up if you're on an agile project where you showcase something at the end of two weeks and you get feedback on it and it changes direction as a result, right? You're all used to seeing this. You're all used to seeing the outcome emerge as you play with it. Um, there was a company called Ludicor. They had this game called Nev Game Never Ending, big online multiplayer game. They wanted to get more people to come play the game. So they said, what we'll do, we'll set up a site where people can share screenshots of the game. And everybody will see how pretty it is, how engaged the players are. They'll want to come play the game too. So they did this, and they set up this screenshot site. And people were able to use it not just for sharing screenshots, but sh for sharing photos of kittens and landscapes and families and holiday snaps. And when the dot-com crash happened, and they were left with this half-finished game, they had to repurpose what they had. And that became Flickr. You couldn't possibly have predicted it, but it emerged. A few years later, Stuart Butterfield, who was the CEO, he tried to get this game working again. And again, this time they managed to get the messaging working for the admins behind the scenes before something happened. And again, they had to repurpose the tools. That became Slack. And he says, if you want to have the, my success, don't, for goodness sakes, try and create a failed multiplayer game. It doesn't work that way. Right? It emerged. It's actually an example of exaptation, using something not for the purpose for which it was designed. So we see these outcomes emerge in software development all the time. We see side effects. We see people use things in unusual ways. We see opportunities in the marketplace. Chaos is actually the domain of urgent opportunity as well, but it is normally regarded as a bad place to be. So in complexity, things are safe. We, we do have some level of safety. So what we do in the complex space, it's called probe. It means to try something out in a way that's safe to fail. Okay. The reason it's important is because conversations are really lightweight and pretty safe to fail. In the middle, we have disorder. Disorder is the fifth domain. It is the domain where we do not know which of these dominates, so we behave according to our preferred domain. So put your hands up if you've ever been asked for an estimate in time or money for something you've never ever done before. Keep your hands up if you're a fool like me and you gave one. Keep your hands up if that got used as a promise or a commitment, right? That's disorder. Taking something, it's high discovery, it's unknown unknowns, we don't know what's going to happen, and pretending that it's going to be okay. All right. I use this little scale to help us estimate where we are on that Kinevin framework. I ask, who in the world's ever done this before? Five, nobody in the world's ever done this before. Might not work at all. Four, somebody outside the organization, somebody has done it before but not here. We have no access to expertise. We have to treat it as complex. It's still going to be high discovery. We don't know what they had in their context that enabled them to do it. Three, someone in the org's done it before, or we have access to expertise. We can learn it from a book, learn it from YouTube. Two, someone in the team's done it before. One, we all know how to do it. Those fives and fours are complex. They are high discovery. That's where the risk is. We don't know what 
the risk is. We can't enumerate the risks, but we know the highest discovery stuff is going to happen there. BDD is an analysis tool. It works really, really well for that small subset of problems which require expertise where the outcome is known. Breaking things down works when it's something mechanical, something that can be the sum of their parts. But when we're dealing with complex stuff, we have to try something out. So here's how I do it very, very quickly. I don't have a lot of time left. I identify my stakeholders. I look, and I, I, there's a whole blog called Value Streams are Made of People. I put the dev teams in the middle, the customers on one side, the customers on the other. I ask, who stops the devs talking to the customers and getting their requirements directly? There's a feasibility study and a funding board, and a funding board for the feasibility study, and then a bunch of architects and analysts, etc. And if you're in a big enterprise project, this is probably quite a large value stream. And then I ask, who stops them from going live? Okay? And you get ops, security, people like that. Anybody who you haven't spoken to before, anybody whose requirements you don't know about, but is going to stop you if you don't do what they want, you probably want to embrace them. You probably want to either try things out and get their feedback, or have those conversations. Give me an example. Help me understand your requirements. The worst problems come when we treat them as gatekeepers. We treat it like a checklist. And then we've done all the bits that we thought we needed to do. We go to them and we go, is that OK? And they go, no. They don't want to say no to us. They want to help us. Um, so this is a value stream. This is how I map my value streams. I ask, where's your boundary of influence? Because hands up change agents, managers, leaders, right? All your problems are going to be on the other side of that boundary. All your big problems. Those are the people you want to be looking at saying, is it just a checklist? Do we really understand how to get our, our stuff past these people? Now, I talked about how to break things down. Breaking everything down up front would be exactly like waterfall. And here's just a very traditional way that I tend to break things down. I don't do it all up front. I talk about what the vision is. If we go live with this thing, what are people going to be able to do that they couldn't do before? Okay, so. People have a goal. There's some stakeholders with goals. I want to stop bots spamming my site. OK, well, we're going to need to be able to tell if people are humans. So we get capabilities from stakeholders with their goals. And then I go, can you give me an example of that? And already we started getting scenarios out. Just that simple. Can you give me an example? From those, we build features. We might carve things up into stories so that we can deliver them incrementally. Um, and then we write some code. If that works on a project, you would be able to just get this lovely fractal beauty. And we'd go down the pub and we'd talk about how awesome that was and how easy it was to deliver. This isn't what a real project looks like. This is what a real project looks like. Oh, we forgot a bit. And didn't know about that bit there. And it turned out these were all connected. Who knew? Look what I found. And we didn't need that bit. I uh, can't remember what that bit's for. Um, oh. Ah, this is what a real project looks like. <laughs> Dan North calls these the oh crap moments. <laughs> this is what a project is made up of. The Agile Manifesto says we're uncovering better ways of delivering software by doing it and helping others do it. It's not Agile's differentiator. We were doing that back in waterfall days. We're discovering how to discover stuff and how to react to those discoveries. And that's why I love BDD and the conversational side of it. Because we can do that even in complexity. We can have the conversations. And we can throw some of them away. And it won't matter. It's lightweight. It's probes. The different levels of their granularity I just use to work out who I need feedback from, where on that value stream it's coming from. So probe, try something out. Have a conversation. It's just a little bit of a thought experiment. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole capability thing. Um, if you want some of that, uh, go look at my blog. It's a tag called Capability Red. Um, the trick is to do the riskiest stuff first, the stuff you know least about. Okay? Find the stakeholder whose goals you've never, ever delivered to that's most likely to stop you. If you can't find one of those, the product owner's goals, the person who fought for that thing, fought to get the budget, fought to get the team together, they'll probably be able to help you. Find the capability that's newest, the one you know least about. Break it down. 
just get one scenario out. Um, that's more stuff. OK. So exploring by example is the most important thing you can do in BDD. Right? Exploring by example, that's more important than specifying by example. Capturing the ones you're going to keep, writing them down. Try it out. Devs, your power is here. Right? You can explore in code. We call that a spike, a prototype. Get one scenario up and working. Hard code a user. They're already logged in. Why are they logged in? Get that running. Get some feedback on it. It's more important than specifying by example, and that's more important than testing by example. So having conversations is more important than capturing the conversations. It's more important than automating the conversations. If you want to tweak that, go right ahead. Very nearly finished now. It's not about testing. Sorry, testers. It's not about testing. You get tests as a really nice byproduct. Exploring by example and specifying by example are both important parts of it and more important than the tests you get as an a side effect. Right? It's really nice if we can help you with your burdens. Um, for those of you who've started with the tools and found that maybe your scenario is a little bit too granular, they're a little bit brittle, try, just leave them for a moment, go to the conversations, practice having the conversations. When you come back, see if you can make your steps match those conversations a little bit more closely. We tend to intuitively pitch our conversations at the right kind of level. What does it mean for BDD, though? It means this is really boring. We know what refunding a microwave looks like. We've all been there. We know nothing from this. There's no point using this scenario to explore. We used to talk about logging in in the early days of BDD. I'm so sorry. That was bad. We used to use this as an example. Oh my god. Like you learn absolutely nothing. It's really boring. Um, Cucumber used to have adding two numbers together as an example on its front page. I've persuaded Adslack to change that now. Okay, that's really, really boring. If you're in that place where you've all done it before, you can ask, is there anything different about it? And if there isn't, just name it and be done with it. This is interesting. Given Fred bought a 120 kilogram fridge freezer, he didn't bring it back to the shop on his shoulder. It's still stuck at his house, and now what are you going to do? And that probably has some known solutions now. We've been doing this online for a while, giving refunds to people with fridge freezers stuck at their house. But I bet you the people who first started it discovered an awful lot about people that didn't know how to plug things in. OK? That's more interesting. So I made you a little sauce of frugal tree this first time I've shown this. <laughs> These are the heuristics I use. Can you get expertise? No. Great, spike, prototype, get something working, get feedback on it. Okay? Have a couple of conversations. If, it's, if you can get expertise, is it because it's really boring? No? Great, you need the expertise, have your traditional BDD conversations, get your three amigos happening. If it is really boring, ask is there anything different about it compared to last time? If there is, spike it, prototype it, get feedback on it. If not, name them, be done with it, start getting some work done. I've taken people who have four-hour planning sessions in which they discussed all their scenarios, and using this got them down to half an hour. I didn't realize I was using fast and frugal tree with heuristics at the time. Um, it just seemed intuitive to me, but there you go. Okay, you'll have a good time with this. And conversations become very much more lightweight and you'll put them where they're most needed. Please don't use this heuristic. We can't accept this into our backlog without clear acceptance criteria. If you do that, you will stifle everything new. You will stifle innovation. When you come across something that resists analysis, that resists clear acceptance criteria, ask, is it because it's new? And if it is, embrace it. Try something out. Devs, spike, prototype, propose a spike, propose a, a prototype, time box it, get something working, get feedback on it. Because having the conversations is the most important thing. That's more important than capturing. That's more important than automating them.
and definitely don't automate anything that's still changing and still highly uncertain. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>